Welcome everyone to introducing the Form 1 uh, Form Labs webinar here on March 24th, 2014. Uh, I'm Sam Jacoby. I manage our community and outreach here at Form Labs, and I'm joined by Jenny Milne, a design engineer here. And we'll be answering your questions as well as giving you a broad overview of the Form 1 uh, in all its many and fantastic facets. We're joined by Jory and JP, who are going to be helping out in answering your questions, monitoring the YouTube comments, and our Google Plus feed. Uh, quickly, I want to run through what it is we'll be covering in this presentation, as, as well as some of our upcoming webinars. Uh, this kicks off a series uh, in which we're going to be telling you a lot about the Form 1, uh, introducing you to its basics, as well as diving deeper into how to use our preform software, uh, which will be handled in a webinar on Monday, March 31st. Uh, that's next week at the same time. That'll be a great time to stockpile your really tough and detailed questions about our 3D printing software, because we'll be joined by some of our software team. The following week, we will be joined by a guest, Robert Vignone of Mold3D. Some of you may know his work. He posts it online. He does incredible models, prints, uh, that really push the Form 1 to the limits. And as importantly, he does an amazing job prepping and finishing his part. So he's going to share with us some of his tips and tricks, uh, which, which will be pretty cool. In this webinar, however, we're going to mostly focus on introducing those of you who are less familiar with the Form 1 to how it works, what makes it special, and what makes it a great tool to use. We're going to run through the printer itself, the preform software, the available materials that we supply. We're also going to take a look at some of the fantastic Form 1 prints out there. And Jenny is going to give us a tour of the incredible pieces that have been made on the Form 1. We'll take a look at some of the different finishing techniques you can apply to prints, as well as a quick high-level tour of what our community is up to. And I know that many of you are joining us now, and a warm hello to all of you who we know from the forums, from Twitter, Facebook, or wherever. A few notes about the Q&A process. Please ask questions in our Google Hangout or in the YouTube comments. You can use the Q&A app. Uh, we'll answer them as best we're able, and we're going to try to answer them in the section that we're on at that moment, just to keep things relevant. If your question doesn't fit into a section, we might save it for the end, or we'll make sure to make a note of it and address it in a subsequent webinar. We're taking a look at all of your questions, and please, I want to let you know that we value all of them, even if we don't necessarily get to your question. Um, we're also going to take special care to uh, have Jory and JP out on the web answering some of your questions in text if they're able. Quick note, because I know this is always a question we get asked, this webinar will be archived online. You can watch it later. It'll be on YouTube. You can go get yourself a snack, uh, and we will be here uh, in digital eternity. Uh, with that, I think we are going to move on to the meat of our presentation and take a look at the Form 1 uh, and what makes it special. Uh, so what is the Form 1? Um, in very simple terms, it's a 3D printer. But we really think of it as a lot more than that. Uh, it's really an entire suite. Uh, we have our preform software that's powerful desktop software that allows you to maneuver, configure, and arrange your parts. We have the Form 1 itself, uh, which we'll take a look at a little more closely in a slide or two. And we have the materials that we supply for the Form 1. And I'll talk about those a little bit as well. Uh, so what makes the Form 1 so special? Uh, particularly in the last year or two, there have been more and more desktop 3D printers showing up on the market. Well, in, in very simple terms, there, the Form 1 is a stereolithographic 3D printer. Um, that's a big word for something that is really quite simple, uh, though perhaps a little more complex to execute, um, and is illustrated by this graphic here. Uh, this is a, an abstraction of the guts of a Form 1. 
In this animation, you can see a laser, that's a, an ultraviolet laser, being reflected upward into a tank of liquid photopolymer. Uh, that photopolymer is cured in layers. Uh, so it's not a thermal process, it's a photographic one, in a sense. Um, and what this does, it allows us to make parts with extremely fine detail, extraordinarily high resolution, and a fantastic surface finish. And we'll go into that a little bit more as well. In addition to that, um, something that I know many of you have appreciated and that we uh, work quite a bit on here in the office is making a machine that is exceptionally easy to use. Uh, there's one button on the Form 1, uh, and that's not because you need to tap a complicated Morse code into it. That's because, in our experience, most people go from model to print in about 10 to 15 minutes. There's no calibration. There's no special song and dance you need to go through. It is truly a, a plug and play experience. And we have devoted a lot of energy to making sure that your experience, your user experience, is as good as possible. And that's really in line with our overall mission in working with the Form 1. Uh, it's, it's a tool that's not just for people who are excited about 3D printing. It's a tool designed for people who want to use 3D printing in their work. Uh, that's the designers, engineers, architects, artists. That's people who have a practice. Maybe you work with 3D models. Uh, maybe you send out for them. Maybe you're just getting into it and seeing how they can work for your business. But it's a tool that doesn't force you to really get deep into the weeds of 3D printing, but lets you get right out and running, creating amazing parts uh, and getting your work done. Looking a little bit at some of the specific advantages of a stereolithographic printer like the Form 1, one thing that you don't need to spend a whole lot of time looking at 3D printing uh, to understand uh, is that layer height is generally the most common metric by which people compare printer performance. It's roughly analogous to, I don't know, DPI or something like that. It's kind of a, a, a metric which communicates, hey, this is how good my parts look, this is how uh, good they feel, this is how fast my car goes. Uh, in the Form 1, we can print at a number of different layers. Uh, one of the more common ones we print at is 100 micron thick layers. Uh, and this graphic is pretty interesting because it shows you that the way in which a stereolithographic 3D printer, the Form 1, generates those layers creates details with an exceptionally smooth surface and exceptionally well-aligned layers. What that means for you is that parts from the Form 1 feel basically like a finished product out of the box. Um, the surface finish that you see on the rook there on the left, that's without polishing, that's without any special treatments, that's after a light rinse and isopropyl alcohol, um, and you're off to the races. Uh, FDM machines, you know, and that's, uh, and that's machines that use a thermoplastic to uh, melt successive layers, something like, a, uh, something like a glue gun or similar, generally leave much more noticeable artifacts in those layers. Quickly, uh, looking at some of the, uh, quickly looking at some of the essential specs of the machine, uh, these are the details. Um, the print bed, oh, looks like we have a little typo there. The print bed is 125 by 125 by 160 millimeters, about five inches square by six inches tall. Uh, resin retails for $149 a liter, uh, and the, the retail price of the machine is $3,299 US. Um, we can print at three different layer heights, 150 and 25. Uh, I encourage you to head over to our website at formlabs.com where there is a more extensive uh, write-up of the various technical specifications of the machine. With that, I want to move on and take a look at some of the other elements uh, of the Form 1 package. Uh, that $3,299 is not just the machine itself, it also is our preform software, which is freely available for download on Windows and Mac. And I encourage any of you to navigate over to formlabs.com slash software uh, and 
uh, take a look at downloading it and play around uh, with some of its features. Again, this is something that we will take a much deeper look at next week uh, when we're joined, joined by Manuel and Jory, who will dive into our software. But I want to highlight some of its really uh, top features. One thing that is pretty uh, fantastic about it is the automatic support generation. Uh, so if you're familiar with 3D modeling, uh, you may work in any variety of CAD tools, uh, which I'll, I'll touch on a little later. Um, perhaps Rhino, SolidWorks, ZBrush, Mudbox, you name it. You export your file, you bring it into Preform, uh, and then in one button you generate supports. And these supports are needed to support the model while it's being constructed in 3D. Preform does this for you. All the supports you see in this presentation and on our website are generated automatically. And that's one of the things that we are most proud of uh, in our software. We're continuing to work on that software and those automatic support generation features to make them better and more powerful for you, uh, but that's certainly one of the highlights of the tool. Additionally, Preform has automatic part repair built in. Uh, this is through an integration with the NetFab libraries. Some of you might be familiar with that tool. It's a great one for uh, working with uh, complex meshes. And we've taken some of those utilities and baked them right into Preform. So even if your STL has some issues, even if uh, your chosen CAD program generates wonky models, you can take them into Preform. We'll clean them up and make sure that they print well. That's the software side of things. Just as important as the printer itself, just as important as Preform is the resins that we supply. Um, you know, when I was speaking at a webinar not so different from this, a while ago we only had one resin available. We now have three. We have white, clear, and gray. Uh, those resins are all fairly similar in their material characteristics. They're all acrylic photopolymers, and you can take a look at the detailed uh, technical specifications and uh, MSDS on our website. Uh, I know we do have, uh, you know, we are continuing development of materials as quickly as we can, and we have a long and ambitious roadmap uh, to begin research and exploration on. I know many of you in the audience, I see a question about lost wax casting, and we are certainly well aware uh, that uh, many of you are interested in that application, uh, and I can only tell you that we're working on it. I don't have a timeline. Uh, we're a little bit of perfectionists over here at Formlab, so that means that we only let things go into the wild once they are good and ready. And I think that uh, you uh, and many of our current uh, customers appreciate that. Um, but we are working on a variety of different resins. Uh, similarly, uh, briefly addressing some questions about resin in the resin tank. Um, you can generally leave resin in the tank for a couple of weeks. We do recommend that you need to agitate it and sort of refresh it uh, once you return to your printer. If you are leaving your printer for some time, it might make sense to remove it entirely. Um, particularly with pigmented resins, uh, you might notice some of the pigment filtering down to the bottom, uh, and you'll want to rub your, uh, the included scraper gently over the surface of the PDMS to keep it agitated. Uh, I'm going to push on now. Uh, I see there are still some questions about materials, uh, and I think maybe we'll get a chance to answer them towards the end of the presentation, but we have a lot to cover. Uh, the Form 1 also includes a finish kit, uh, and that is a, a set of tools that help you clean and polish your part well. Um, and that's a, a, a sort of, can, can make it much simpler and easier to take your parts off of the printer and rinse excess resin from them. Um, so how do you actually use the Form 1? Uh, I, I wish there was more to tell. I love talking, and uh, there really isn't such a, a grand story here. You start with a 3D model. Uh, you can get that 3D model three ways. Uh, you can design it yourself, and that's what we have here in the upper left, in SolidWorks, and Rhino, AutoCAD, you name it, whatever your chosen CAD program is. 
You can download it off the web, and there are many different places where you can get great 3D models. Uh, and increasingly, you can scan a model. Uh, that's something we've done a little bit in the office. Uh, but is just getting a lot better as more and more tools are coming to market. Then you load uh, your model into Preform. Preform ex accepts uh, STL or OBJ files. Uh, so you'll import your STL or OBJ into Preform, load it up, maneuver it, generate supports, choose your layer thickness, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and then you basically hit the print button and you send your model over to the Form 1. It does its magic. Uh, you go get yourself a cup of coffee, sandwich, dinner, whatever it is. You might be waiting a couple hours depending on the size of your part. You might be waiting overnight if it's a really big one. Uh, and then you detach it from the build platform, take it over to our finish kit, rinse it in isopropyl alcohol, uh, get it all nice and clean, and then you are good to go. You can paint your part. You can use it to check fittings for injection, injection molding. You can do all kinds of excellent, excellent, excellent things. Um, such excellent things, really, uh, that I can, I'm going to hand it off here to Jenny, who is going to tell you about some of the beautiful parts uh, and very useful things that you can make with the Form 1. All right, so a lot of you are probably interested in printing prototypes, like many of our Form 1 users. So here's just a little showcase of, yeah, some of the great prototypes people have been producing. So we have a, you know, a strut with varying cross-section. Um, you can see on the far top right corner, actually printing uh, a linking chain. This is a nice example that's often shown in 3D printing um, of things which, you know, are are generally easier to print than to, to manufacture in a complicated way. So all the chains are printed interlinking, and then simply by peeling it off the supports, you have a fully functioning chain. Um, on the watch, you can see a lot of detail on the dial. Um, we can do, as, as Sam mentioned, you know, 300 micron detail. So we can do things like raise text. Um, you can extrude little details. Um, that shock absorber in the bottom center is actually, you know, takes advantage of, there is a softness to a material, um, and there's a spring on the outside of that that you can actually push and play with, and as long as you um, use appropriate design dimensions, you can kind of print features like living hinges and, and yeah, uh, features which have a plyness to them. Um, and then finally in the bottom right is, uh, a piece you may recognize from the Form 1. This is actually uh, a prototype of our the build platform handle. So here is an example of us 3D printing a part um, which has been designed for injection molding simply to test the fit, the feel, the function before going to expensive tooling. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of beautiful prints. Um, some of these prototypes are for products which are in development and, you know, the, the, comp the partners we're working with keep these things under wraps, but um, wanted to share some examples of that with you today. Um, another great thing is architectural study models. Uh, we, we, sh we used the Eiffel Tower as a, a really a great showpiece. Um, this part was actually printed in two pieces, so you know you can develop models which are larger than that build volume that Sam mentioned um, of 4.9 inches, 4.9 inches by um, just over 6 inches. Um, then we have some smaller also architectural study models. Um, these ones in particular were produced by the Harvard Geometry Lab and in the bottom right corner um, some study models produced by students at the Harvard Graduate School of Design um, in our class we, we helped with this January. Medical study models is another big application um, for stereolithographic 3D printing. Um, a lot of the times it's used, you know, you can create your STL or OBJ from a 3D scan. So that's what's done in the dental industry a lot. Um, you can scan a patient's jaw, print out a study model, and then you know plan the appropriate procedure to move teeth, adjust teeth, uh, things like that. So that's a growing and very exciting industry. Um, so those are some more specific applications. But now I just want to showcase you know some some cool things which we're able to do with SLA. 
So here's a piece which was in our original Kickstarter video showing an internal channel. So here you can actually um, inject liquid and move it through uh, an internal channel in the object. Here next is our famous Neptune character, which really showcases some of the tiny detail we can achieve, both on the detail in his face and his fingers, and on the trident itself. This is really an impressive piece when you get to see it um, up close and personal. Also a nice trick with 3D printing, um, similar to the chain that we showed earlier, is to actually print fully articulated parts. So this requires some design thought where you um, are creating a model with different pieces with enough gap in between them that when you remove the supports, um, they're joined and can move around. So this crab here from Brian Chan is a really nice example of that. And finally, another showcase piece from um, one of our guys here at Formlabs, Will Walker. Here's a beautiful lily that he modeled. Um, and you can see just how thin that is. Um, this is kind of an example of something where we're really kind of pushing the capability of the of machine. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how thin that surface wall was. I believe it may be just shy of a millimeter. Um, and so there's quite a lot of support cleanup that went into that, which leads me nicely on to finishing. So most of the pieces we showed in the previous section are all in their natural state of clear resin, gray resin, or white resin. Um, but there are things you can do to get it to an even higher fidelity prototype. And as Sam mentioned, actually, we're, our third webinar in this series with Robert Vignon will really focus on this stage, finishing your prototypes. Um, and painting is one of those things. So here's a nice prototype of a mouse that was printed in three separate pieces for final assembly. Um, and simply with a bit of primer and some spray painting, we can get something which you can both play with ergonomically and it can also look like your final design. We have also used 3D printed form on pieces to make molds. So here we have a piece which has been cast in silicone. This is the design for um, a band for a child to be used after an injection. Um, and so the design has printed the inverse mold and then we're able to cast in silicon this softer material. So you can make molds, especially when it's a room temperature cure, um, as it was in this case. Um, and finally, a really nice trick to get a metallic finish on your parts without spending the amount of money needed to print in metal. Here we've had some parts electroplated. Um, so there's a lot of companies that offer this. You can print something uh, in our resin and then send it away to a company to um, electroplate it, which gives a really nice, stronger piece and sort of higher fidelity finish. Um, I might actually, while I'm talking to you, take some questions. Um, so someone was asking, are there currently any planned form on service bureaus? Um, this is not something we're actively working on, but one company uh, we give a shout out to is 3D Hubs. So if you go on their website, several Form 1 users have listed their printers as available uh, machines. So with 3D Hubs, you just put in your location and you can see what printers are available. And from talking to those guys, I understand there are 50 or 60 odd machines on there. So that's one nice way to have something of yours printed on the Form 1 and inspect it yourself. Um, another question here about shrinkage. Some printed parts such as long thin profiles and flat surfs are prone to shrinkage. How can I minimize that? So this is something I've seen, especially with thin, yeah, thin materials. Um, where I find the biggest issue is, is actually when you're rinsing it in the alcohol. So with very uh, thin walls, what actually happens is the part starts to absorb isopropyl alcohol as you're cleaning it. And then when you let it dry and the alcohol is evaporating out, it can start to warp a bit. So if that's the issue you're referring to, uh, what you should do is instead of rinsing it for the 12 minutes, we sort of state as a good rule of thumb, rinse it for a slightly shorter period of time and then also allow it to fully dry whilst on supports. The supports themselves will actually help reduce the part curling at the edges or warping. Um, 
And if it's particularly delicate, you can also leave it in general UV light or put it in a UV oven for a couple of, uh, a little bit longer just to fully cure it. Those are some good tips. Um, but finally, this is the last section. I'm going to hand it back to Sam, and we're going to look at some beautiful showcase pieces from some of our community members. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, quickly, some of you know these people. Uh, for some of you, they'll be new. But we have a great community out there. I suggest everyone head over to our forums, forums.forumlabs.com, and check out some of the great work that Forum 1 users have been putting out there. This is Robert's work. Uh, we've been talking about him a bunch. Uh, and he will be back here in a couple weeks. I also want to point people towards his great online 3D printing resource. Mold 3D. You just go ahead and Google that. And he does such a fantastic job, not just modeling, of course, but also preparing painting, sanding, and airbrushing as parts. And I think that's interesting to a lot of model makers and artists out there. Similarly is the work of Brian Anderson, another fantastic model maker and a really creative guy who has created a world around his polyoptics labs. Uh, and his Vera Explorer is a fantastic piece with integrated electronics. A ton, a ton of fun. We've had some of his parts in the office, and they're very neat to look at. And that's another example of a kind of figurative work that is done with the Form 1, along with the work of Collis, who does fantastic designer toys with incredible finishes. I think he put many, many layers of paint and polish onto this guy. Just a few f highlights from our community. Uh, and, of course, we always love it when you share your work, when you go online on Twitter or Facebook or wherever and let us know what you're up to. So please don't hesitate, and then we can share it to others. With that, I'm going to move on to showing you some of the resources available to you uh, before heading into our Q&A session. I've mentioned our forums. Here they are at forums.formlabs.com. Our support site, which has a wealth of information out there, many of you are asking questions where we, which we have whole articles on in our support site. Uh, so head out to support.formlabs.com for tutorials, troubleshooting tips, and all different kinds of advice on how to get the most out of your Form 1. If you have questions about purchasing a Form 1 or just general concerns, you can email sales at, I think that is not the correct email address, actually. Try hello at formlabs.com. That's hello at formlabs.com. I don't actually know what happens if you email that address. So that, that can be a challenge to you as well. Uh, and of course, you can always contact our all-star support team at support at formlabs.com. And if you have a printer, if you're having problems, please uh, shoot them a note, and they will take care of you. Just a quick additional note for those of you watching this webinar now or in the future, we always appreciate any feedback you might have. Uh, so head over to formlabs.com slash webinar uh, to uh, get uh, a survey, which can help us out, certainly. Uh, so please, we value your feedback. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm going to dive right into our Q&A session and start working through some of your questions. I know there are a number uh, that I've answered and that Jenny has answered. Um, I'm going to start with a question from Phoebe. Uh, she says, I'd like a squishy, rubbery material, anything like that in the cards. I would say definitely, yes, it's in the cards, but what cards, I can't exactly say. Uh, you can get a sense of the range of photopolymer materials available by looking at the marketplace and looking at some of the 50, 70, $100,000 machines. And they do have uh, materials with various mechanical properties available. We are definitely aware of the value that those would provide to you, uh, and we're working on it. I have no timeline on that. Uh, I will say to any materials experts out there, join us. We're growing quickly, particularly in materials research. So we're hoping to put that together. Joseph asks, uh, what's the minimum volume of resin necessary for a single print, a single run? And can resin left over in the tank be reused? Um, good questions. What's the minimum volume of resin necessary? Uh, it varies. It depends on the print you're printing, obviously. But you need at least as much resin to cover the bottom of the tank. 
So that's probably something on the order of, uh, oh, I don't know, 50 milliliters. But the tank itself in total holds about 250 milliliters. Uh, so that's something that's sort of your maximum fill. Um, 200 milliliters might be a, a safe amount there, so you won't risk an overflow. And can resin left over in the tank be reused? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's sort of it's good practice after you complete a print to run the scraper tool gently across the PDMS uh, to aerate it as well as to make sure that there aren't any fragments of cured resin left in the tank. But beyond that basic routine maintenance, you certainly can reuse the resin left in the tank. Matt asks about electroplating. What limitations in metallics are there? And does that change depending on the SLA resin being used? That is a fantastic question and a question that I, I can honestly say I don't think any of us here have great answers for. Uh, I know that we have used a commercial electroplating service bureau. Uh, I believe they are called the name is escaping me at the moment, but they are lovely, and we'll, be make, we'll make sure to post the name of them in the comments as well. Uh, in general, our resins are all very similar, and my understanding from talking to them is that they can work with a whole range of different resins. Uh, I think multi different colored resins are fine. They put the part through a, a, a chemical process to treat it and prepare it for electroplating. Uh, so you have some flexibility there. Michael has a good question uh, about the Eiffel Tower part that Jenny shared. Uh, with larger parts like the Eiffel Tower, are there tools in the software to break the part into pieces? Not in our software. Um, so our software essentially takes a whole STL, whatever that may be, and prepares it for printing. Uh, there are other software tools. I know that the gentlemen over at ZBrush are actually working on tools to help you split your part into pieces suitable for 3D printing. And of course, different CAD programs have different utilities uh, to permit that. So uh, there, there certainly are ways of doing that, good ways of doing that. Preform software oh, doesn't. Um, David asks a good question about switching colors of resin. Oh, there's multiple Davids. All right, I'm, David, I'm gonna, David Woodbury, I'm going to ask your question. Does a computer need to be attached to the printer during printing? No. No. Once the part's been uploaded to the printer, you can disconnect your laptop, you can disconnect the USB connection, and walk away uh, and go along your merry day. Um, so uh, that's definitely something, something good to know. And that's really how we use printers here in the office. We have a whole bunch of printers, as you can imagine, uh, and we... Uh, generally just walk up to them, throw our laptop down, load up the part, disconnect it, and walk away. Uh, Dave, oh, oh, it's the same David. Oh, I see, I see. You're a busy fellow. Um, how do you switch colors of resin? A bunch of different ways. The simplest way, the way I would recommend, is really to have multiple resin tanks. That just keeps your life easy. Uh, cleaning out resin tanks can be a, a bit of a hassle, but of course you can empty uh, your resin tank into a bottle. We don't recommend that you empty it back into the original bottle. If you have a, an old opaque bottle, uh, that, that might serve well. Not that it's bad, but uh, it might have small fragments in it or something like that. Um, and then kind of carefully clean off the PDMS. We do not recommend that you use isopropyl alcohol in the tank itself. That will damage the PDMS layer. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, let's see, what else is interesting out here? Uh, Eugene asks, I have some clear resin. How can I add colors to them? Will it be safe to do so without damaging the resin tank? That sounds interesting. You are free to head over to our forums, forums.forumlabs.com. Ask questions there. I know there are many people who have experimented with dyeing, tinting, adding additives to resin in various ways. Uh, and uh, I think their mileage has varied. It's important to note that the tanks are replaceable. Uh, if you destroy a tank, we sell them online. They're $69. Uh, and in fact, we do recommend that you replace your tank uh, regularly. 
Um, so uh, if you do re damage your resin tank, the consequences are not irreversible. Um, Joseph Conrad, who is inter is interested in more detailed cleanup procedures, I highly suggest you check out our webinar on April 7th, where we'll be going into detail on finishing your print. We'll have Robert Vignone on hand, who will talk about his different tips and tricks. So that is certainly uh, something, uh, something to keep an eye out for. Um, Robert, uh, Robert asks, uh, do you have any measured stress, strain, shear, and compression to expect as to functional parts? Uh, we do have numbers on a variety of those uh, measurements. Uh, the full details are on our website. If you head over to formlabs.com and you take a look at our materials page, there is a downloadable data sheet where we have Young's modulus and a variety of other, a uh, variety of other parameters that you can play with. Um, just scanning through these, seeing what's interesting. Matthias Kurlau asks, is it possible to connect multiple Form 1s to a computer? Is the software able to differentiate them? Uh, at the moment, uh, I understand that it's not. Um, you, can't do, you can't do two at the same time. You can certainly uh, plug in one printer and then another, and we do that routine, routinely so we can use one computer to control multiple printers. But you can't wire, say, four Form 1s into a single USB hub and address them differently. Uh, that may be something that we solve in, in software uh, further down the line, but uh, I don't have any kind of timeline. That would be a, a, something great to add into our feature request uh, queue on our forums. Um, I'm going to address Richard Walter's questions. Do you, do you have, uh, oh, uh, how will heat affect the materials after they've formed? Do they soften and droop as heat increases? Uh, that's a really good question. I know that a variety of people have been experimenting with our resin as, uh, as a, a tool to use in investment casting and, and, and seeing how it burns out. We haven't done any specific experiments on heating it uh, and seeing how its mechanical properties change. So that's certainly uh, something interesting for you to look at. Uh, and, and again to you, Richard, do you have any discounts or programs to assist students uh, or fab labs in obtaining Form 1s? Uh, at the moment, we don't have any formal programs. That's definitely something that we are thinking about. We, of course, you know, love students. We love researchers. We love people doing cool things. You can always write us a note, uh, and we'll keep you in mind when we put uh, different things uh, in place. Um, these are some good questions. I think I'm going to pass... Uh, pass the microphone over to Jenny, uh, and she will handle uh, a raft of them while I have a sip of water. Mm -hmm. so. All right, let's see what we've got left. Um, so Trapier Hall asks, what is NetFab? Um, so NetFab is a great program. Um, they have a free tool you can use to help repair meshes. Um, so Maybe a little, little bit more complex concept is, but what makes an SEL or an OBJ easy to print? And again, we have a nice article on this on our support site. Um, but depending on how you make your 3D model, you can have intercepting surfaces, or you can have other weird geometric things that leave holes or other issues that don't make a perfectly solid um, 3D print. So in the past, we used to recommend that you ran your model through NetFab to repair this. But more recently, we have included a lot of these wonderful mesh repair features into Preform. So now, even if your model has some issues, like there are some uh, small holes, there are things you may not no visibly notice um, by looking at the model, but the way it's been broken down into layers can be a little messy. So Preform will make you aware that there's been some issue with your model, and it will um, use you know, tools um, to, to repair it and make it a clean 3D print. Um, mm -hmm. 
Let's see. So, what else? Sorry. Um, Todd's saying he's having a problem with supports with unintended merging or even failing during printing. Is this normal? So, Todd, it depends what you're printing. You know, obviously, this is not normal. Um, when you have very dense support settings, um, and to, to preface this, uh, Preform, our software, has a lot of nice automatic features. So it has automatic support generation, it has automatic orientation, but depending on what you're printing, you may want to um, delve into these a little bit deeper. So you can hit the advanced support drop-down menu and vary things like support density, support tip size, and this can reduce effects you're seeing like supports merging or being particularly difficult to move and things like that. Beyond that, if you're seeing this repeatedly or your part's not particularly challenging in your eyes, um, there could be a problem and obviously I hope you are already talking with support at formlabs.com. Um, this is the kind of thing our experts will be happy to help troubleshoot with you and determine um, what's going on there. Um, Someone asked, sorry, Billy Wardlaw asked, are there any performance differences or curing time difference between the available resins, clear, white, gray? Um, there are differences between the resins. Um, we vary the way the machine works depending on what resin you choose. So when you are preparing your model in preform, you need to select whether you are using gray, white, or clear. And this will vary. Um, various things to do with the cure time and things like that. But it's all hidden away, so you don't really need to worry about it. Um, in terms of performance differences, we do have MSDS, which is the Material Safety Data Sheet, for each of our resins on our website. Um, but they are fairly similar in terms of their properties. I think we also have different text spec for each of them. No, so yeah, the clear is the base material and the white and gray are fairly similar in terms of properties um, other than obviously they have an opaque finish which is nice and it kind of gives a nice smooth surface finish. The clear has some, it's not optically clear by any stretch of the imagination but you can finish it, and I'm sure Robert Vignon will have some tips on that, to a near window like effect by polishing it or using acrylic spray and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's mainly aesthetic differences. Um, yeah, Phoebe Schmidt is looking for a nice prosumer 3D scanner. Uh, we don't actually have a model of choice that we like to plug at Formlabs, but this is a great question for our community. I'm sure there are, uh, I'm aware of many people who are working from 3D scans and you know, I'm also aware that while, you know, the Form 1 has brought affordable stylus SLA 3D printing um, to the masses, there's some really interesting stuff going on with uh, more affordable high-level 3D scanning. So why don't you pose a question to, um, yeah, our, our community, and I'm sure people will come up with some great recommendations for you. Um, yeah, so Matthias talking from as a dental technician, are there any possibilities uh, for performing in the dental industry? Absolutely, there are big possibilities. Obviously, the kind of secret sauce which everyone in the dental industry is asking us for is a lost wax casting resin. As Sam's already said, that's still in the pipeline. It's not something we have available today. However, we are aware of, you know, there are dentists working with the Form 1 for, as we showed, study models. So you can absolutely take 3D scans, you can print jaws, um, you can print other models for inspection, um, and yeah, it depends on your needs. In the future, we should have a lost wax casting resin, um, and then obviously you can do more intricate things with mold making and things like that. Um, but it's certainly a space we're excited about and, and want to support. Um, so yeah, I think we're getting close to the 45 minutes we scheduled for this webinar. So um, at this point, please feel free to move on to what else the day has in hold for you. Um, I think I'll pass back to Sam, and we certainly will be sticking around for another few minutes to try and pick up any new questions that are coming in at the last minute. Um, so yeah. Thank you.
Thanks, Jenny. Uh, taking a turn in the limelight here. Um, Lee asks about difficulty in printing large prints. I would say there is no surefire trick other than a, a large print, as you well know, exaggerates the importance of optimal orientation, uh, a clean tank, uh, having everything in, in tip-top shape. And that might be a, a, a good question that Posting photos as, as well as your form file will uh, help us answer as effectively as possible. Um, Mark Annette asks, what is the minimum height of raised text? Um, I think it really depends on how legible you want your text to be. Uh, certainly the text will show up even if it is just a millimeter or two high. Uh, that's not a problem. Um, and I think that probably is a fairly good rule of thumb. As Jenny mentioned, our minimum feature size is on the order of 300 microns or so. Uh, so you can print pretty small raised text. You might need a magnifying glass to see it, but uh, that's a, a guideline for you. Um, OK, Billy Wardlaw asks, uh, an interesting question. Uh, is heat buildup in air pockets an issue like it is with FDM? Uh, Billy, uh, because the Form 1 is a stereolithographic 3D printer, it, it uses a totally different technology than your standard FDM printers. Uh, rather than heating a extruder head, uh, it moves a very fine laser across the surface. So there isn't any thermal buildup to speak of. Related to that is the Form 1 is a relatively low power device. Because you're not pouring all that energy into heating an extruder head, it doesn't use a whole lot of power, uh, which is a, a nice feature it has. While I'm on the subject, it's also very quiet. Uh, because you don't have a noisy XY stage zipping around going as fast as possible, uh, just a pair of silent galvanometers maneuvering, maneuvering the laser. Um, you, know, you can work comfortably side by side with the Form 1 without losing your mind. Um, let's see here. Um, Peng Yang asks, can the Form 1 print parts with tiny particles mixed into it? I have no idea. I don't know if we've ever done that. If you do that, uh, I, I, my guess would be it, it wouldn't work. Uh, but I don't really know what you mean by tiny. Uh, but uh, but uh, I would say your, your mileage will vary extremely uh, once you start experimenting. And you will have to be prepared to destroy your resin tank and potentially your build platform. Uh, Mark asks, I'm not getting response to service requests in 24 hours. What should I do? Uh, Mark, we do our best to respond to everyone as quickly as possible. Uh, our support team is fantastic. Uh, if your message has really been overlooked, you can always send another note, and we do apologize, but we strive to get back to everyone within 24 hours, and we really pride ourselves uh, on the quality, uh, the expertise, and the attention of our support team. And that's, that's a really important part of what you're getting when you get a Form 1. Uh, and I think if you look through our forums and resources, you will see, uh, you'll see how well we take care of uh, all of our customers out there. So that is certainly something important for us. Um, I see there's a few other questions, some about maintenance. Uh, I think we will save those for a subsequent webinar. I do want to answer Raymond's question. How often do you need to replace the resin tank? Uh, this, the simple answer is it's not how often so much as uh, how much do you print. Uh, we generally recommend that you replace your resin tank every uh, two to three bottles of resin that you go through. Uh, so two or three liters of resin, if you're picking those up on the store, it's probably also a good idea to pick up another resin tank as well. Um, with that, I think it's probably time for us to sign off. Uh, please remember uh, to head over to formlabs.com slash webinar to fill out our survey. We'll also send out an email with that link. Uh, and this webinar will be archived on our YouTube channel, so you will be able to view it there. Just as a reminder, I encourage you to RSVP 
for performing with Preform. That's our webinar next Monday at 2 p.m. We're going to take a close look at using our Preform software and also get into uh, a number of the deeper questions that on uh, print performance and reliability that some of you have asked. Uh, and then the following week, uh, we will take a look at how to best finish your print. Um, for all those of you whose questions we didn't get to, uh, we'll do our best to follow up with you. Uh, you can always shoot us an email, support at formlabs.com, uh, or ask your question in the forums. With that, uh, thanks from all of us here for joining us, uh, and we hope to see you next week.